عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته شيخنا كيف الحال؟ الحمد لله بخير سيدي الحمد لله الله يبارك فيك الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters الحمد لله وما شاء الله it's a blessing to be alive it's a blessing to be here with you all ما شاء الله and uh, we are going to start uh, again with our beloved uh, respected Sheikh Aqari Aqari our Masjid the teacher of the Quran in our Masjid Sheikh Ismail Isa inshallah ta'ala jazakum Allah khair أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر أن الله يولج الليل في النهار ويولج النهار في الليل وسخر الشمس والقمر وسخر الشمس والقمر كل يجري إلى أجل مسمى وأن الله بما تعملون خبير ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأن ما يدعون من دون الباطل وأن الله هو العلي الكبير ألم تر أن الفلك تجري في البحر بنعمة الله ليريكم من آياته إن في ذلك لآيات لكل صبار شكور وإذا غشيهم موج كالظلل دعوا الله دعوا الله مخلصين له الدين فلما نجاهم إلى البر فمنهم مقتصد وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا كل خط كفور يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم واخشوا يوما واخشوا يوما لا يجزي والد عن ولده ولا مولود هو جاز عن والده شيئا إن وعد الله حقا فلا تغرنكم الحياة الدنيا ولا يغرنكم بالله الغرور إن الله عنده علم الساعة وينزل الغيث ويعلم ما في الأرحام وما تدري نفس ماذا تكسب غدا وما تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إن الله عليم خبير صدق الله العظيم جزاكم الله خيرا صدق الله مولانا عظيم وبلغ رسوله الكريم نحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين ما شاء الله uh, the message this evening brothers and sisters is a message 
of hope and a message of, of uh, inspiration. We're going to look at the life of the great companion, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah was one of the most eminent, the most prominent of the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we're talking about specifically his response to, pl to plague and his spot response to the disease. And at this time, when a lot of people are concerned, a lot of people, some are afraid, some are anxious, some people are angry uh, about what's happening. A lot of people are confused about the decree of Allah. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has turned our entire lives, the entire world upside down. And looking at the example of Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, gives us some guidance, gives us some reassurance, gives us some hope and a model of how we need to respond in the times in which we find ourselves. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu was described as a man that, who was slim and tall and his face was radiant. His face, he had a face that was very bright, very radiant, and a sparse beard. You could hardly see his beard. He, his beard was not thick, like, for example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had a long, thick beard that filled up, went to his chest, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Baydah's beard was very sparse, very light, yeah, very small. He didn't, he didn't grow long. And it was very pleasing to look at him. May Allah be pleased with him. In fact, it was refreshing to meet Abu Ubaidah. When you met him, he just brought a sense of ease to your heart. Radiallahu anhu. And also, he was known to be very shy. Hayat was his quality. But if there was a situation that was difficult, if there was hardship, the companions say, he would become alert and he would become uh, tough and he, and he radiallahu anhu would become very serious like a flashing sword in, its, in his severity and his sharpness. So he had these two aspects, very shy, very humble. He's described also as being very humble, very shy. But if a situation called for severity, and toughness, he was the person that you wanted to be on your side or leading you. As we'll see, he was in, he was a great leader of the ummah. He is the companion who Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu described as Amin al-Ummah, the custodian or the, the caretaker, the trustee of the nation of the Prophet sallallahu Notice these attributes. Because Islam is all about attributes. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, is described as al-Amin, al-Ma'moon, al-Sadiq, al-Masduq. He was known as al-Amin even before he received the Qur'an, before the bi'tha, before he began his mission. The trustworthy one. He was so trustworthy that even his enemies from the Quraysh still entrusted their valuables to his care, even though they were denying the truthfulness of his prophethood, of his nubuwa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Ubaidah had his share of this attribute, such that Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu an, may Allah be pleased with him, described him as Amin al-Ummah. His full name was Amir ibn Abdullah ibn al-Jarrah. But he was known among the companions and he's known in the books of Sirah as Abu Ubaidah. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, one of the companions of the Prophet wasalam, said, among the Quraysh, among all of Quraysh, there were three that were the most prominent. 
three that were known for having the best of character, who were known as the most modest out of all of the Quraysh. And he named them as Abu Bakr, Uthman ibn Affan, Abu Bakr, Uthman ibn Affan, and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu. These were the three. So this, I want you to understand the eminence of this companion before we get to the main heart, the main lesson of our, our dars today, inshallah ta'ala, of this lesson today. He was respected by the greatest of the companions. He, radiallahu anhu, was one of the first to accept Islam. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq invited him. In the early days, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was, main, was one of the main da'is, one of the main inviters to Islam. In fact, the Ashra Mubashara, right, uh, many of them, most of them became Muslim through him, through his da'wah. At least half of them, if not more. And Abu Ubaidah was one of them. Abu Ubaidah was one of them. Abdul Rahman bin Auf was one of them. Uh, they all became Muslim through the da'wah, through the invitation of this great soul, this great hero of humanity, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. And uh, he became one of the closest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa He experienced the difficulties and the toils and the trials of the early days in Mecca. He, radiallahu anhu, was present at Badr. He was even present at Uhud when he defended the Prophet Sallallahu when the enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu were calling out, where is Muhammad? Where is Muhammad? So that they could fire, uh, shoot an arrow at him Sallallahu Abu Ubaidah was one of those who formed a shield around the Prophet Sallallahu and risked his life so that the Prophet Sallallahu would come to no harm. On the battlefield, at battles like Badr and Uhud and Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench, the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, they were weary of Abu Ubaidah. If they saw him in a rank, they would go the other way. <laughs> right. Until he was known for being someone who was fearless and feared. There is the story of how he actually, subhanAllah, that he actually killed his own father, his own father, Abdullah, on the battlefield, because his father would not go the other way. And this was a time when he had to make this difficult decision. He didn't want to kill his father, but he knew what was at stake, that the safety and the security of the men and the women and the children of the Muslims was at stake at that moment. And so he actually uh, killed his father on the battlefield. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was the, uh, he was one of the companions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam chose when a group of Christians asked for someone uh, this was a group of Christians that had come all the way, you know, all the way from far away to ask for someone who could lead them, someone who could judge between them regarding the questions of property, which they disagree about. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent, uh, he waited till the evening and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said that he heard the Prophet was going to select someone known for their discretion and known for their wisdom and known for their intelligence in judging between people to send to this group of Christians. And Omar said, after the prayer, I was actually trying to make myself seen so that the Prophet would choose me. But he did not choose Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu Rather, he looked around, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until he found one who he described as trustworthy. And he chose Abu Ubaidah 
Ibn al-Jarrah, saying to him, go with them. This was actually after Salatul Dhuhr. He said, go with them and judge among them with truth about that which they are in disagreement. And he is the one who got the appointment to serve this community of Christians. He was trustworthy. He was Amin, radiallahu anhu. And he was also known for his strength, not just the strength of his character, but the strength of his, his physical abilities. And he was so, uh, he was so uh, known for his courage that on the battle of Uhud, when the helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu had been struck so that his forehead was, was, was injured, and the chain mail, the chain mail had stuck in the cheeks of the Prophet Sallallahu And his tooth had been broken, Sallallahu His tooth had been chipped, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the companions were wondering what to do to remove the chain mail from the cheek of the Prophet Sallallahu without causing further harm. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was going to remove it, but Abu Ubaidah said, please leave that to me. And he proceeded to take out this metal chain mail of the helmet with his teeth because he believed that if he used his hands, it would hurt and cause more damage to the Prophet So he used his honorable teeth and he removed one, he pulled one out, breaking one incisor and it fell to the ground. And then he used the other incisor and that one broke and came out of his mouth and it fell to the ground. Look at the sacrifice of these great men and women. And later on, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used to joke saying, Abu Ubaidah is the best of us at breaking teeth. <laughs> Subhanallah. And then brothers and sisters, I want us to, we're gonna jump just because of time to two episodes that involve Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Ubaidah. After the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at Saqifah, Saqifah is a place that's very close to Masjid al-Nabawi today. Where the, if you ever go to Hajj or Umrah, it's that place, it's a, it's a garden, it's a bustan, and it's gated now. And uh, on the left of it, is the date market, the old date market that used to be there. The souq of the Prophet Sallallahu also used to be in that direction. And after the passing of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of the companions met there, some of the Ansar, the helpers from, Mecca, from Medina and the Muhajirun, the immigrants from Mecca, they met in that garden. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said to Abu Ubaidah, stretch out your hand so that I can give you bay'ah. Can you imagine? Out of all of the companions, Umar radiallahu anhu felt and believed and thought that the person most equipped to lead the community of the Muslims at that time was Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu. But what did Abu Ubaidah say? He said, I would not do that. And this is when Umar also said, you are Amin al-Ummah. You are the Amin. You are the custodian of this Ummah. He said, I will not put myself forward in the presence of a man whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam delegated the leading of the prayers and who led us right up until his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Here again, we see the humility of Abu Ubaidah. How many other people would have said in that instance, I accept your bay'ah, O Umar, right? He said, no, no, Abu Bakr is Siddiq. <laughs> MashaAllah. So again, this establishes the kind of person that Abu Bakr, that Abu Ubaidah radiallahu, radiallahu anhu was. And he served under Abu Bakr is Siddiq never disobeying him, never disobeying a command. And after the death of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu about two or three years later, and Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu became 
Amir al-Mu'mineen, he served under Umar and he always obeyed him except in one instance. He only went against his command at one time. What was that time? It was the time when a plague had been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Asham, on greater Syria, or what's called by Orientalists and historians, the Levant, which is now comprised of Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and modern day Syria. And Abu Ubaidah was there leading the Muslim forces from one victory to another, one victory to another until all of Sham, the entirety of Sham was under Muslim control. The Euphrates River was to his right and Asia Minor where Turkey is and all that, the place going all the way to Europe was the Mediterranean, was on his left. And it's, as, it's at this time that the plague struck them, and it was devastating. Just as the plague that has struck us at this time, this virus, this new coronavirus that has struck us at this time, is devastating the world, right? Devastating the United States, devastating New Jersey. This is why we're not together physically in the Masajid. This is why we are not, our children are not going to schools. This is why we're not out and uh, about doing our regular activities. And so there was such a plague in Sham, in greater Syria, and tens of thousands of companions passed away from this plague. Immediately, Umar ibn al-Khattab heard about this plague. He sent a letter to Abu Ubaidah saying, I am in urgent need of you. If my letter reaches you at night, I strongly urge you to leave before dawn. And if my letter reaches you in the, during the day, I strongly urge you to leave before evening and hasten to me. When Abu Ubaidah received Omar's letter, he said, I know why Amir al-Mu'minin, the commander of the faithful, needs me. He wants to secure the survival of someone who, however, is not eternal. He's speaking about himself. He knew that Sayyidina Omar wanted to save him from the plague. He knew that Sayyidina Omar wanted to save him so that he could continue to serve this Ummah, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with his knowledge, with his courage, with his military uh, prowess. He was a master strategist, Abu Ubaidah was. He was like, Umar described him later, he was, before that, before this event, he was equal to 1,000 men. We can understand why Umar anhu would want someone like this to stay alive, not just for his benefit, but for the benefit of the whole community. But Abu Ubaidah, in his humility, he recognized, I, my life is not given to me to be on this world, in this world forever. He knows that eternality and everlastingness belong only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he responded to Sayyidina Umar, he wrote back saying, I know that you need me, but I am in an army of Muslims and I have no desire to save myself from what is afflicting them. Look at his leadership. This is a true leader. A true leader does not you know, like we see a lot of times in our particular modern geopolitical context, the leader is hunkered down in an undisclosed location, safe, while he sends his armies, sends his, uh, uh, those under his authority to go face danger and may possibly lose their lives. That was not how the Prophet ﷺ led. 
That was not how Abu Bakr led. That is not how Umar ibn al-Khattab led. That is not how Uthman led. That's not how Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu wa karamallahu wa led. That's not how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa raised these men and women to lead. Uh, that's not how they led. That's not how Nusayba led. That's not how Aisha radiallahu anha led. And so he refused to go, to be loyal to his men, to be loyal to the men and women that were with him. He said in, this, in his letter, I do not want to separate from them until Allah wills. So when this letter reaches you, release me from your command and permit me to stay on. This is how the believer faces death with acceptance. This is how the believer faces a plague or an epidemic or a pandemic with acceptance, brothers and sisters, with acceptance. This is one of the meanings of the word al-Islam. It means surrender, it means submission, but it also means acceptance. Taslim, which is from the same root as the word Islam means acceptance. And Abu Ubaidah had accepted Allah's plan for his life and for his death. He accepted Allah's decree. And he also was aware of the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ that when a plague comes to you and you're in a land, you do not leave that land. And if you're outside of the land, you do not go into the land. We know this from a hadith that's related by Imam al-Bukhari. He knew this. And so there's so many things going on here. There's his own humility and, and lack, complete lack of self-importance. There's the, his own humility and his complete lack of entitlement. Why, why shouldn't I be saved so I can lead more Muslims to victory in armies and other places, right? That's how some people might think, but not Abu Ubaidah. He was loyal to those under his charge. Not only that, he knew that if he left Syria, there was the risk of spreading the plague to other lands, to other people. And he did not, again, have this sense of entitlement that somehow I counted more, that I deserve special treatment. Like you hear some people say, right? You hear even some leaders in the Muslim community say this, I deserve special treatment or I am entitled to this because of how long I've been serving or because of how much I have studied or how much knowledge I have or how much money I have given. No, this is a wrong way to think, brothers and sisters. Take your example from Abu Ubaidah with how to respond to such opportunities to, to save yourself or to benefit yourself, opportunities of privilege at the expense of others. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, he sent this letter to Sayyidina Umar, and Umar read this letter, tears flowing from his eyes, crying, because he knew that the decision of Abu Ubaidah could prove to be fatal and lethal for him. My, my computer is about to die, bismillah. And when Omar read his letter, those who were with him asked, has Abu Ubaidah died? And Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu said, no, but death is near him. And Omar was not wrong because before long, Abu Ubaidah succumbed to the plague. And as death overhung him, he spoke to his army. And I want you to listen to these as we conclude. Listen to what he's saying, sick with the coronavirus of that time, knowing that his death is imminent. Listen to the words, his advice, because his advice to his men and women in that time is advice for us now. Because just as they were facing an enemies that were human, they were also facing another enemy. It was this disease. And we too, we're facing 
an enemy. You even hear our politicians using the words that we are at war. This is like a battle. This is our khandaq, so to speak. When the companions of the Prophet and the Prophet were at the battle of the trench and they were surrounded by 10,000 enemies from the Quraysh and their allies. This is like when they were in their, in a sense, in their own quarantine in Medina, right? Brothers and sisters, Abu Ubaidah said to his army, let me give you some advice which will cause you to be on the path of goodness always. Establish prayer. Brothers and sisters, establish the prayer in your home on time. Don't let not being in the masjid be an excuse for not doing all of the obligatory, the five obligatory prayers on time, at the correct time, at the first of their times. And this is a mercy for us because maybe some of us, when we were at work, we didn't pray on time. Maybe some of us uh, would delay our prayers outside of their time. May Allah forgive us for doing that. Pray on time, establish your prayer and pray with your families. Maybe before this quarantine, before this lockdown, we rarely prayed with our families in our homes, but now Allah Ta'ala has given us ample opportunities. And maybe now even another month or more of being able to pray in jama'ah in our homes. The Prophet Sallallahu encouraged us to pray the sunnah prayers in our homes. He's saying, don't, make, don't turn your homes into graveyards. So prayer brings life to our homes. And then he said, fast the month of Ramadan. The purpose of Ramadan is to discipline the soul, restrain the nafs, restrain the self, the appetites, so that one can cultivate the, vir the virtue, the character trait of ataqwa, of reverence for Allah, of obedience to Allah and avoiding his commandments. Ramadan essentially is not about certain foods that we eat in Ramadan. It's not about socializing or coming to the masjid and drinking chai or lassi with our friends. Ramadan is not even ultimately about praying tarawih in the masjid. In fact, the sunnah of tarawih is to pray tarawih at home, especially for those who have memorized something from the Quran. It's actually better to pray tarawih at home according to many of the madhahib than to pray it at the masjid if you have the discipline to do that. So focus on the true purpose of Ramadan, which is, as Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ to develop taqwa of Allah Ta'ala. He says, give sadaqah, give charity. And that includes, of course, zakat. We should not stop giving charity, brothers and sisters, because we are no longer in the masjid. The masjid is still serving people still taking care of the poor. The masjid still has operating expenses. The masjid is still offering these online classes and so on and so forth, and working with other institutions, churches and synagogues and temples to respond in a united effort to this crisis. And your support, your prayers and your money and your suggestions are needed now more than ever. And your volunteering, your time is needed now more than ever. There are many masjids that have teams of people that buy groceries and medicine and deliver it to the doorsteps of those who are sick and shut in. So give sadaqah in this time. Don't let this be a time when you withhold your charity, withhold your zakat from the masjid and from those who are in need of it, because the, the need has increased in this time of crisis and financial distress and illness. He said, perform the Hajj and the Umrah. And even if we are currently at a state where we cannot physically go to Mecca to make Umrah, and Allah knows best if we'll be able to make Hajj this year. 
May Allah forgive us. You know, we don't know. And I have heard some scholars say this, and it's true. It is true that maybe this is a punishment from Allah Ta'ala for this ummah at this time, that this generation, maybe we've done things that are so wrong that Allah is protecting the Kaaba and protecting Majid and Nabawi from us. That is very much uh, possible. But also consider this. Perhaps Allah Ta'ala is purifying our hearts and refocusing our hearts and our souls on Him so that the sha'air of Islam, the distinctive features of Islam, like the Kaaba, like Masjid Nabawi, like going to your, our local neighborhood Masjid, are no longer veils, are no longer obstacles that prevent us from focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe Allah is also preparing us, purifying us for a higher and deeper and more meaningful relationship with Him. Maybe that's also, and that is not a punishment. That is actually a great reward and a great blessing. And I pray that our state is the latter and not the former. And then he ends by saying, remain united and support one another. Be sincere to your commanders, to your leaders, and do not conceal anything from them. As I said, we need your suggestions. We need your advice, especially those of you who have experience with these matters, with building community and with, and with disease prevention and, 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 and mending and reconciling hearts in this time. This is not a time for division. This is a time to hear and obey your leaders, as long as we do not command you, order you, or ask you to do anything that goes against the Quran and Sunnah. Some of you I know are still establishing Jumu'ah in your homes. I'm asking you to not endanger yourself or others, brothers and sisters. Heed the advice of your leaders. Don't let the world destroy you. For even if man were to live a thousand years, he would still end up with this state that you see me in. Peace be upon you and the compassionate love, compassionate love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's how he ends saying, don't let this dunya destroy you. Don't let this dunya distract you. Stay focused on your real purpose. Your real purpose is not to make money. Your real purpose is not to uh, make your friends or your family happy. Your real purpose is not to lose yourself in mindless entertainment. Right? Your true purpose is to worship Allah. Is to worship Allah. And your relationships, your money, your even your entertainment, all of those should be ways and means not ends in themselves. They should be means of building a greater, stronger, deeper relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with those words from Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, I will end inshallah ta'ala. If there are any questions, if there are any questions uh, about this topic particularly, um, then I will take those. Uh, I don't want, I'm not going to answer any questions about unrelated topics this evening. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless you uh, who for tuning in. If there's anything we can do to uh, make these online sessions uh, more um, uh, edifying for you, to, to uh, in increase, improve the quality, if there's certain topics that you would like to suggest, if uh, others also find them to be of benefit, then we'll definitely consider talking about those topics myself and the other scholars and other teachers that have been providing content to you. Jazakumullah khairan. And if there's any, again, if there's any questions or comments, you can write that in the chat. I will also unmute uh, the participants. If there's something you'd like to say or ask, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, this, uh, the, this dua about uh, during this pandemic, you know, 
So maybe during this time while we are meeting every evening, maybe we should have that dua for the pandemic. I believe one time in the masjid you had that dua about Ya Hafiz, Ya Salam, I think. Allahu Akbar, yes, yes, that's, so, that's a very good idea. Yes, thank you for that. That's yeah. Brother Mas'ud, right? Yes, either we start with that or end with that, that dua. Uh, mashallah, that's, that's a very good uh, idea. And actually there's another dua that um, I want, uh, actually there's a few duas I plan to share, but uh, inshallah we can do that one tonight. Coming, coming, yeah, eight seconds, I'm just coming. We can do that one tonight, inshallah. Thank you for your, that reminder, Brother Masood. Any other questions or comments related to the topic tonight? Okay, bismillah. So we'll close with that dua. And that's a dua that uh, was shared with me. Uh, it's from Sheikh Muhammad Jilani, who's a well-respected scholar around the world. Respected all over the Muslim world, mashallah. And um, he has many students uh, around the world. And uh, he's, he, at the very beginning of the outbreak, he said that if you want to stay healthy and you want to be protected from this, from this, uh, this uh, pandemic, then make reciting this dua a habit. And what that means, I want to be it doesn't mean we don't take precautions. No, we must still take precautions. It does not mean you don't go to the doctor or you don't call 911 if uh, you are having symptoms. It does not mean you don't take medicine. What it means is if you make this dua, you should be absolutely certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you or me the means, the asbab that, are, that we need, that will give us the resources that we need to stay healthy and to recover. That's what it means. That's, why, that's the power of dua. And of course, if Allah wills, he can protect a person directly without any uh, means and heal a person directly. But that is not generally the case for most people. That's not generally the case for most people. And so this dua, it's uh, composed of four parts. Four parts. The first thing you say, I hope you all are writing this down. The first uh, part is to say Al Fatiha. All right. And I'll write it in the chat. You can read it in the chat as well. Those of you who are on your computers or on your mobile phone who logged in, you recite Al Fatiha one time. And then you recite Laysa Laha. This is from the Quran. Min dunillahi kashifa. Seven times. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I, there's a typo there. Laysa laha. I'm sorry, it's a typo. Min dunillahi kashifa. Okay, yes, so you say that uh, seven times. Okay, something, uh, uh, for some reason is coming up is haha, and I'm, I'm pressing the lamb. <clears throat> Laysa <coughs> laha. Min du milahi ka kashi. Okay, for some reason, I think the autocorrect, yeah, it just happened again before I sent it. So the autocorrect is changing the, the, the L to an H because Laha is not English, of course. So there it is. So Al Fatiha one time, and then you recite Lay Salaha Min Dunilahi Kashba, which means there is uh, nothing, there's, there, there's nothing besides Allah that can lift it, meaning lift this uh, trial, this tribulation, this fitna. And then you recite Allah's name, Ya Salam, seven times. Then you recite Ya Hafiz, seven times. And then you recite one uh, Salat Al-Nabi. 
sallallahu alaihi wasallam one durud sharif okay uh one time so i i do this with my my wife and my children and uh that should say durud sharif not sharif uh, so we'll, we'll end with this inshallah ta'ala i encourage you to do this at home alhamdulillah uh, i encourage you doing it after every fard salah after every fard namaz and even if you're for example a woman who uh, because of your um, monthly cycle or postnatal uh, bleeding you're not praying you should still recite it at the times of salah inshallah the five times of salah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة 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 يا سلام 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 يا حفيظ 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 اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عدد خلقك ورضاء نفسك وزنة عشر عداد كلماتك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين في كل لحظة نبدا عدد خلقك ورضاء نفسك وزنة عشر عداد كلماتك Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Have a blessed night. Assalamu alaikum. Keep us in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. So, mashallah, thank you for the announcement. Uh, global fasting this Thursday, April 2nd, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. May Allah help us to uh, fast and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to do such acts even when there's no emergency and no crisis. May Allah ta'ala make uh, these good acts of these global acts uh, mashallah a, a means for a new culture in our muslim community so we are more connected jazakum allah khaira brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam jazakallah khair wa alaikum assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh